welcome to another episode of Lexitecture, a podcast about words by word nerds and for you. My name is Ryan, and in each episode, my friend Amy and I will be talking about our two favorite words of the week, looking at their origins and history, and generally chatting about how they got to where they are today. If that sounds like your cup of tea, come along for the ride and let's explore the weird and wonderful world of the English language. Today's episode, Pornography Anatomy. Hi everyone, just so you know, this week's episode contains some subject matter that some people might find a little bit offensive or too much for them, so maybe give this one a miss, or just make sure you're listening without any young ears around. Partway through this episode, you'll also hear Amy reference an excerpt from a novel that she's going to read. We've put that at the end of the episode, so if you want to listen to the episode itself and then stop before the really graphic, gruesome bits from a crime novel come into play, you're welcome to do that. Otherwise, keep listening and enjoy. <laughs> we actually got a, uh, a listener email. No! <laughs> yeah. How uh, wonderful! Someone emailed, they sent in a... Uh, a listener by the name of Sarah sent in an email. Uh, she had found something on Reddit uh, that was... It's a meme that I've seen around, and it's basically someone... It's a screenshot from, I believe, Tumblr, where someone had posted this meme where it has... Uh, it's just text, and there's several words, and they've been broken apart. And so it's words like she and woman and female... Mm -hmm. uh, where the, so the S from she is on one side and then the he is on the other side. Right. You know I mean? Got and you. Okay. W mm -hmm. and a man and then fee male. And so the, the original meme is like, the idea is look how language is trying to make females, women just, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I've, you know, I've seen a similar thing before. Um, yeah. I'm struggling. To, I can't come up with a word that I'm, I'm thinking of, but just, uh, derivative is what word I was thinking of, of the male version. And then the post underneath it is uh, a person who at least is presenting as a linguist who is basically saying, this is complete rubbish. It's not how, it's not how this works. Here's how all of yeah. these different words came to be and how oh, none wonderful. of this makes any sense. It's this big, long thing. And so anyway, Sarah had emailed us and said, do you guys seem like the people who could probably fact check this? What do you guys think? Also, love your show and thanks very much. And I'm spreading the word and stuff and fellow oh, word nerd here. So I was like, wow, this is super cool. That is super cool. The word I'm going to talk about today is anatomy. A-N-A-T-O-M-Y, which the OED always forget the word, derives, uh, de no. Defines? Oh my God, defines, yeah. Why <laughs> does that word jump out of my head as soon as I have a dictionary in my hand? The, OE, the OED defines anatomy as... The branch of science connected, concerned with the bodily structure of humans, animals and other living organisms, especially as revealed by dissection and the separation of parts. As a countable noun, it's the, the bodily structure of an organism, so descriptions of the cat's anatomy and behaviour, a person's body, a study of the structure or internal workings of something. And the origin, as given in the OED, is of late Middle English from Old French, anatomy with an IE on the end or late Latin anatomia from Greek from ana up and tomia cutting from temnain to cut. Oh. Yeah. Isn't that an interesting one? Anatomy is literally cutting things up. That's... It is not looking at the whole thing. It is looking at the specific parts that the scalpel or whatever tool you've decided to use has incised from the other parts. Wow. So, firstly, this is interesting because you just don't consider that that's what the word damn well means. It's also very interesting to me because, you know, given the job that I do and the interests that I have, I very much love the language of anatomy. So, yoga teachers, there, there's no kind of standard as to how yoga teachers are taught to teach yoga. Some courses talk in a great deal and in a, in a lot of uh, detail about anatomy and how it relates to what we're doing and what people are doing with their bodies in our classes. Some courses are not quite so in-depth and there's lots of different ways to teach anatomy and lots of different kind of models and all the rest of it. So I started to work with 
my now mentor learning about functional anatomy mm, nearly oh, about a year and a half ago and discovered A, I love this shit and B, <laughs> bodies are endlessly fascinating, incredible, wonderful things and when, particularly when you look at functional anatomy so functional as in the sense of the way that we actually use our bodies um, functional anatomy really isn't big on the notion of this part, this muscle, this tendon, this vein, because when you're looking at functionality, you really have to know about how the whole system works. Right. So for me, when I started to look at this word, I found it very, very interesting that it, it's in fact, it's, it's all about cutting things up, which is how anatomy kind of came to be, you know, how our knowledge of the human body kind of came to be a thing. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, my first thought was, I, I would have expected it to be something along the lines of may, maybe related to an inventory or a count or a, a list or the body, mm. like something like that. Yeah, that's an interesting way to think about it. That that one hadn't really occurred to me. But the fact it, that it's, it's literally tied into cutting up. Yeah, it's also, uh, Etym Online states that dissection from the 1540s uh, was another meaning of the word anatomy. So the the... The word oh. came to mean came to be used as the, as the act to describe the act of dissection. Also, mummy, fifteen eighties, and skeleton, fifteen nineties. These were primary senses of this word in Shakespeare's day. the The meaning of the science of the structure of organized bodies predominated from the seventeenth century of persons, oh. as in the body from fifteen nineties. So, I'm I'm sure I remember noticing in Shakespeare, I forget where, that when Shakespeare talks about an anatomy, he means a skeleton. Mm. So that, you know, it's also often misdivided again in older English, middle English texts and in Shakespeare as an atomy or a anatomy. Oh, right. Which is, uh, which is an interesting one from a John McWhorter point of view because still reading that fantastic book, little bit at a time, <laughs> and the, the misdivision of words like that is one of the many interesting and really varied ways that, that words get, get to evolve and develop throughout centuries. So the other interesting thing that anatomy brought to mind when I started looking at this is that it reminded me that I was aware of the Greek root temnein, and the word which made me aware of that is temesis, which is worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. It's worth mentioning for a lot of reasons. Firstly, because there aren't very many words that begin TM. So it's an interesting word because it looks interesting, it looks different. Temesis is spelled T-M-E-S-I-S. So yeah, I'm I'm just I'm now finding the entry for this in my OED because of course I'm organized enough to have had that place marked. <laughs> right. No, no, I'm not. I'm just <laughs> not that human being. And Temesis, I think I first became aware of what the word Temesis meant when as a young English undergraduate I bought one of the most interesting and wonderful books I've ever owned, a dictionary of literary terms. Oh Super yes, geeky. so useful, wonderful. Uh, when I was an English teacher, it, it really was. Uh, it was my bible. So Tamesis is defined by the OED. Hey, I remembered what the word defined means. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it is the separation of parts of a compound word by an intervening word or words used mainly in informal speech for emphasis. Right, and. Tamesis is literally the cutting apart of a word to insert another word inside. So mo in English, certainly, most of the examples are, as the OED says, informal. So I can't find it any blooming wear or yeah. absolutely or fan fucking tastic. I love Tamesis as a technique. It makes me happy. And I try to insert pieces of words in the middle of other words far more than I should frankly. <laughs> and and it, it's interesting to me that you can cut words open, split them apart, 
add in new things and make them a little bit different and a little bit more interesting in the same way that presumably you can do to bodies. And that our knowledge of the, the whole structure and how it works and how it all comes together is in fact derived from that the deconstruction of that. Made me happy. Mm. So That's anatomy. fantastic. Yeah. And like, I mean, it, it makes so much sense when yeah. you get over the initial shock of it being completely other than what you thought it might be. And I would but, very much encourage you to go and have a look at the history of anatomy. It's fascinating. Yeah. Because, I mean, in, in, in Scotland particularly, we have we have the, the... I was about to say fairy tale. It's absolutely not the word I want at all. Um, we have Birkin hair to hang anatomy onto. And of course... Burke and Hare were grave robbers. No, in fact, that is often how Burke and Hare are defined. But Burke and Hare were not grave robbers. Grave robbers took dead bodies out of graves. Burke and Hare cut out the middleman and they killed people to give to the anatomists. <laughs> and the Anatomy Act of 1832, I think the first time I became aware of this was uh, reading and researching Jekyll and Hyde, one of my all-time favourite classic novels. And, of course, when you read about Jekyll and Hyde, you think about Burke and Hare. It's, it kind of comes into that theme of Edinburgh as a city with an underbelly, even though Burke and Hare is... Uh, Jekyll and Hyde is set in London. It's very much accepted by scholars that Stevenson was thinking about and, and talking about Edinburgh right. um, in, in the, the, the novel. Edinburgh is a city that is sometimes described as all fur coat and no knickers. You heard that phrase before? I have not, but I'm a big fan. Yeah, I I, I really like it. I really enjoy it. And um and yeah, it, it's it just really encapsulates that sense that you have these grand, really beautiful buildings and, and surroundings and Edinburgh. It's that kind of upper crust sort of place, but that actually it's you know, it, it's as seedy and as sketchy as, as any other city, any other big city, certainly. So the Anatomy Act of 1832 is an act of parliament that gave freer licence to doctors and teachers of anatomy to dissect donated bodies. It was actually, uh, it, it came out of the illegal trade in corpses, it says in Wikipedia. It was enacted in response to public revulsion at the illegal trade in corpses. So prior to 1832, anyone who was practising anatomy was breaking the law. But, oh. you know, it's it's an interesting one because certainly... Anatomy saved lives, saves lives, and our knowledge of that is, you know, knowledge is generally a good thing to have. However, the the trade in corpses, the illegal trade in corpses, definitely not a good thing to have or to happen. No. Um, a, a, a really a really clear indication of what happens when you monetize things that shouldn't really be monetized. Mm-hmm. Um. So, yeah, in that sense, cutting up, most definitely, cutting up in the crudest and quite disgusting way. You mm-hmm. know? Um, and if you if you ever go to Edinburgh for a bit longer than you did the last time, because I know you've been, um, and you get the chance to visit the, the dungeon, that it's like a, oh, sort of yeah. a museum come to, this, you know, the, the Edinburgh dungeon. They have similar, they have, they have them in London and York and places like that. And they take you to there's there's a sort of a, a, an area of the attraction that's all about Birkin hair, and they talk about the fact that there was a, a particular pub that had a snug, so a sort of a semi enclosed area with a table in it and, right. and seats around the outside, and the anatomists, the scientists would go to the pub and the resurrectionists would bring the bodies there and they would prop them up in the snug so that the <laughs> anatomists could take a look and decide which ones were freshest and which ones oh. suited their suited their purposes best. Wow. So yeah, a word with quite a bloody history. Now when and now I think uh, <laughs> among certain sections of the world, I yoga teachers, it is often a word that makes people go, ooh, or uh because people yeah. have this notion that it's super complicated and inaccessible and, and, and 
you know, and, and it is, but it's also great fun and very interesting, in my humble opinion. And it's also very sanitized today. Yes, very like much so. Like it's a very clinical thing. We get to look at cutaway diagrams. Yes. And 3D images and all these kind of cross-section uh, yeah, and, and you find even and you know me- medical students are trained using models for for yeah. certain procedures because of the unavailability of of cadavers. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting mm, word. That's very cool. Or so I thought. <laughs> no, absolutely, I think I second that. I think that's a, that's very cool. Thank you. Um, You're quite welcome. I'm trying to think of which. Uh, yeah, we'll just go with that one. So. Uh, staying on the theme of slightly more bodily. <gasps> I body see what you just did there, Ryan Paulson. Things, right. Um, I see what you. Oh, I don't think I approve. <laughs> Next time we're going to flip a coin to decide who goes first. <laughs> I know it's awesome. Oh. Uh, so my word okay, is. Okay, continue. My continue. Word... <laughs> Do you know what that is? That is actual hubris right there. Because hubris <laughs> is... Uh, hubris is, feel, uh, is... Is basically batting aside the hand of fate. That's what hubris is. Oh, right. It is turning aside from the will of the gods. So, well, if it makes be it, it on better, your I'm... head. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I don't end up doing that that pushing a rock up the mountain thing. That sounded like oh, that would be really sucky. Yeah, um, better than the having your eagle, having your liver torn out by an eagle every well, day, yeah, and doubtless. then having it renewed at night because you're immortal. Yeah, that's that. That was one of my faves. That would also be fairly terrible as ways <laughs> as as far as ways to spend eternity go. That's pretty far down on the list. But you know, sometimes the simple ones are the really good ones, like Tantalus. That's an amazingly wonderful way to torture someone. <laughs> you know, was, I, I, that was the one that uh, oh, I'm. He was in a pool of water, and there was uh, there, there was fruit hanging from a branch yes, just above and his it head. Just couldn't reach. Just couldn't reach it. Yeah. yeah. Whereas Narcissus just gets to be a flower forever. Like that's yeah. you know, I feel like that kind of got off easy. I, I, there was obviously like some kind of work day out the night before the gods had to come up with that one. Everyone was feeling a little bit, you know, they were not at their best that day. No, no, they were all hungover. Yeah. Stupid Bacchus. <laughs> um, if Sorry, it makes you feel continue. Any better, if it makes you feel any better, the, I, I did pick this one because it was on top of my pile, so. Yeah, yeah, whatever. I mean, you don't buy that. Nobody <laughs> buys that, but that's fine. So the, my word for uh, this time around is pornography. Do you know, Ryan, that is really interesting because I recently researched that word as a potential lexitecture spot. Oh, there we go. Well, I better be, uh, I better have my I, I didn't, one now. I, I didn't get too much further with it, but uh, we could, we could have had, uh, we, we could have had a double, double episode. Oh, you know? that would have been fantastic. Where you <laughs> talked about it and I talked about it and yeah. hopefully we would each have our unique interest and spin or we'd just be saying the same thing twice. <laughs> but it would be one of those so, one in a million opportunities. So either way. Yeah, yeah. So Damn. tell me the, about pornography. Um, yeah, so the 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 first definition uh, in the OED for pornography is, quote, the explicit description or exhibition of sexual subjects or activity in literature, painting, films, etc. in a manner intended to stimulate erotic rather than aesthetic feelings and then printed or visual materials containing this. So that, obviously that difference, the line between uh, in a manner intended to stimulate erotic rather than aesthetic feelings is, has kind of been a point of debate for a long time, right? Like what counts Mm -hmm. as art, because obviously nudity in art has been around forever. It's as old as art. Yeah. And attitudes toward that have changed. Um, it's sort of been an ebb and flow on what is acceptable levels of nudity or not um, Mm -hmm. over time. And then, of course, the famous uh, United States Supreme Court trial back in the 60s where uh, Justice Potter Stewart came up with his uh, sort of obtuse and obscure uh, esoteric way of describing it when when he was asked, like, sort of, what is the difference between something that's obscene nudity or whatever 
than something that's mm-hmm. artistic. And his his line was, "I know it when I see it," as far as mm. pornography goes. And that's that's come very down. that's very interesting. I read something about pornography. In fact, it may well have been what sparked my interest in the word in a novel. And once you finish talking about this, I'm going to go and get the novel and I'm going to read you the description because, yeah, the the, the I know it when I see it kind of idea notion about pornography is it's interesting the thing i find the thing i find interesting about that just on a a slight tangent but is because obviously the the sentence i know it when i see it is essentially subjective like Mm. it's self-aware subjectivity of course i know it when i see it but this is coming from a u.s supreme court justice who gets to decide for everyone else, because he knows it that when he is sees interesting. it. And so he this idea that where that line gets drawn between art and pornography is always essentially subjective for someone, and it's the people mm-hmm. in power, obviously, who get to decide where the obscenity laws and stuff like that come down. And so it's just interesting that it's, it's so, uh, at its core, it's so subjective, and he knows it. But it's it's just how it has to be when you're drawing a line between erotic rather than aesthetic feelings evoked by a mm. painting or movie or whatever. So that was kind of anyway. That's kind of interesting. Um, and we'll circle back to that idea of power and stuff uh, a little bit further down this road. But cool. way back, so the the word pornography, as it is used now, is borrowed from uh, French people. Think that sort of um, mid to early eighteen hundreds. There was this uh, an academic treatise that seems to have coined the word in modern usage pornography, um, but it pulls its meaning from uh, the ancient, uh, the Hellenistic Greek pornographos, which literally so the graph is obviously writing about or you know like a biography or lexicography mm-hmm. and all that stuff, um, but the uh, the porno prefix was that it was all about uh, prostitution. Mm. So it was specifically okay. writing about prostitutes or harlots. And so in the mid-1800s, when this French uh, treatise came out, it's it's interesting because it keeps saying, it's uh, all the sources I was reading on it, keep saying that it was a study on prostitution, quote, for reasons of public hygiene. It was research, honest. I seriously, Greek I'm style. just yeah. <laughs> I'm just working on my doctorate, guys. This is everything's fine. <laughs> Nobody needs okay. to just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, mm. But that was interesting to me. That was even then. So it had gone from throughout the millennia, from ancient Greece all the way up to mid 18th century France, uh, or sorry, 19th century, mid 1800s France, uh, specifically tied to prostitution. But then after that, uh, the 1800s being as they were on that scale of where the ebbs and flows of what constitutes obscenity is, uh, mm-hmm. where the 1800s fell in that, it became, it, it kind of got latched onto for reasons that I, I couldn't quite find, but it was just became a word. It became much more popular to be used and expanded greatly from not just things related to specific prostitution, but also just a variety of obscene materials, not even necessarily limited to sexual stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. um, up until this year, you're desperately combing your brain for an an example of something that's not sexual, but, but obscene. Well, up to, up to this year, actually in the criminal code of Canada, uh, there was a section, a statute that made crime comics, illegal it nobody's used it in forever for obvious freedom of speech Mm. artistic freedom reasons but it's been in there until i believe it i believe it's being removed this year and a crime comic was simply a graphic novel describing criminal acts so a, 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 a graphic depiction of a murder would be obscene okay under this statute for when this was coming so that would be the kind of thing um so someone writing about jack the ripper depending on how graphic they were being, regardless of the, the sexuality element of 
his victims being prostitutes, mm, it would sure. still be pornography because it's about obscene materials. Um, but of course, it's it's then since narrowed down to be strictly um, sexually graphic stuff. That's what, that's really interesting because I, I mean, I, I don't I don't have any great expertise on it, but my my sort of general observation is that when you look at things like uh, censorship and and things like film ratings mm-hmm. versus like U- UK versus US oh, North yeah. America I, I don't know the, the the US are incredibly prudish about sex oh and unbelievably don't give a damn about violence no you can watch so, a PG movie that has m- murders left right and center but yeah, one but topless no nipples, woman becomes God, no. an R rated movie yeah it's it's yeah yeah and and I think you know you you have things like even the the British tradition you know like the Carry On movies, and that sort of Benny Hill, incredibly of its time. Yeah. Yeah, and you know you try making a Carry On film in today's current sort of social political climate. I don't think you'd get too far, but but you know that that very clear women as titillating figures and nothing else sense, um, in the British media just didn't didn't seem to get to the states except of course no. it did just just in a slightly less obvious way yeah i don't know yeah. it, 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 it's interesting to hear that about canadian law when my my sort of overall generalized opinion would be oh north americans don't care about violence as long as there are no tits you know yeah, well, that's that's of course generally how it is, but it's really interesting to see how that plays into, like as you say, mm. the sexual objectification of women is not <laughs> that's that's not rare. No, so no, it really, it's really, just, isn't. they just have to be clothed no. for it to happen for whatever reason. Yeah, because reasons because the fifties were wanted to be Victorian England so desperately. Yeah, um, man, society is weird. Yeah, well, and if you look at pre. <laughs> Uh, pre-ratings cinema. There's loads of nudity. There's tons mm. of nakedness yeah, that makes sense. in the nineteen twenty in the silent films of the twenties, and very early kind of talking pictures. Listen, have you ever had the experience of having one of your small children accidentally get hold of your camera or your phone? <laughs> Tell yeah. me what they take pictures of. Oh well, yeah. I mean, anything they can. Always a lot of. Always the toilet. Yeah. Someone either someone in the toilet or themselves and their their bum or their genitals. Yeah. You know, it's like it's an inbuilt human imperative that if you can suddenly take a picture of things, then you will take a picture of your own flesh, especially the bits that you don't generally get to show people. Hmm. That's interesting. But this so I've this... completely derailed what you were talking about. Please continue. No, that's... Tangents are fun. Um, <laughs> well, no, that so that just made me, it kind of, then I kind of went, prostitute is kind of a weird word. And I looked up that. So this is kind of me sneaking a second word in here, but it's because it relates to this. Of course, yeah, yeah. Like me with so, Demesis, indeed. Yeah, so I looked up um, the origins of the word prostitute and prostitution. And it's, so it, the, the prefix, it's a Latin word. So the prefix of pro. Mm-hmm. And this statute is related to, um, kind of is related to statue. It's it's to stand. Okay. And so it was to put forward, to stand forward, to place something in front of people, and it was the context was to put up for sale. And so it doesn't even seem to have originally been tied to the kind of. Sex for sale. Sale of sex, just the sale of, of things. Now it's just the sale, but of course, when you think of things in ancient Rome that would be uh, made to stand in front of people to be put on sale, people were absolutely included with it. It was people. And it so, did occur to me a moment ago when you when you talked about the notion of uh, the word pornography having its roots in Greece and and uh, in ancient Greek. And referring to prostitution, it occurred to me that prostitution in ancient Greek society, you know, what what did that actually mean? 
mm-hmm. famously, uh, you know, especially for the for the the Romans who like to take the Mickey out of the Greeks for it. Famously, um, homosexuality was very much acceptable and accepted in in certain sections of Greek society and in certain kind of modes and ways. So. I tend to think, again, maybe my bad, but I tend to think of prostitution as being an an issue that affects primarily women. And although I know that male prostitutes exist and that male prostitution carries just as much stuff as female prostitution does, I immediately thought of women. And I Mm -hmm. wondered if the ancient Greeks did too, or, or if that's not the case. And as you say, if to prostitute something is simply to display it for sale, to stand it up, to let people see it, then there is no sexual tag there. No, you know, no, no gender specific um, associations with the word. Mm -hmm. Mm. Now the original Greek, like pornography was, that was about kind of sexual stuff, but the, yeah, then the word prostitute comes into play where it's just people for sale. But it was just interesting that the, how closely linked because it would have come down as things for sale and then well the, what stands up in front of people to be sold well people stand up in front of people to be sold and yeah if it's a a girl or woman being sold there's there's a fairly strong correlation between it gets pretty fucking icky quite quickly ridiculously yeah. quickly and so that's sort of how it became tied in with sex for sale is because sexual slavery was such a a common thing in mm. um, ancient Roman where, where the Latins were coining these these phrases. So, um, yeah, not to end on a I would extremely be very dark interested. note, but that's kind of where, uh, yeah, that's where. That's where the word comes from. Wow. Comes down. I would be I would be very interested to know when prostitute became an insult rather than a business term if you like mm. you know if, if you th- it's 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 like you know we, we find this often the how did language get so mean kind of thing but you know to to say to someone that they are a prostitute is you know it's it's insulting it's it's designed to be to be mean it's designed to be uh, pejorative and yeah, I mean, you, you you have to get into a lot of kind of sociolinguistic stuff to, to trace something as socially charged as that, particularly given the nature of the taboo in some societies and in, during some historical periods of, of prostitution. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm so also what um... I'm also thinking is is interesting is that these days prostitutes prefer to be called sex workers. Mm-hmm. Which which somehow brings it back to that sense of standing something up that's for sale, you know what I mean? It it, mm-hmm. it kind of takes away the the charged nature of prostitution as being dirty and taboo and shady, and it says we are people working at something. It just so happens that the thing that we are working at is sex. Yeah, and it cuts out the slavery aspect entirely. Yeah, yeah, it does. Ah, oh, very so, interesting. Yeah. So there we are. Pornography. Does uh, dear old music Roger is the new pornography? Names? Yeah. That that was that was what I thought about because I like the band so much, but also because it's it's a pretty wonderful thing to say. I was Let me get. I read... Sorry, yeah, you, you get you get Roger going. Uh, in the meantime, the one thing that I read about the band, the new pornographers. Mm-hmm. And I would someday, if I ever have the opportunity to actually talk to them, I'd love to find out where it actually came from. But mm-hmm. I remember reading that it's popularly attributed to that quote. Okay. The, the, the idea that music is the new pornography and that's where mm-hmm. the band got their name. But then I read somewhere else that the quote, like the band's name predates that quote. Oh, interesting. And so I, I haven't looked at it anything for, further. So if, I mean, if, I, if there are any people who are into the new pornographers in a more of a deep lore <laughs> kind of way than, <laughs> than me, deep who just lore. likes their music. Uh, if you're into like the lore it. and backstory of the new pornographers, then um, let me know whether that's true or not, because I still it haven't bothered quite, looking up any further than that. 
it says quite a lot about you as a human being, Ryan, that that lore is the word that you use there. But it is absolutely <laughs> one of the reasons why I like you as as that human being. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't history. It wasn't, um, you know, kind of... I the know, story. Or, or, yeah. It, it was lore. Definitely lore. <laughs> I cannot find pornography in Roger. Oh, a little bit is too... That... Uh... Oh, no. So I tell a lie. I'm just not very good at looking. <laughs> <laughs> so we have porn, P-O-R-N, which is given as impurity. Mm. Oh. That is okay. an interesting one. I'm going to look that up. 951. So 950, the section is purity, and then 951 is impurity. I know which column I'd rather be in. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's here that we find porn. In amongst adult, curious, erotic, erotica, facetiae, interesting word, I do not know it, hmm. pornography, hardcore, porn, soft porn, page three, girly magazine, band book, blue film, skin flick, video nasty, prurience, voyeurism, scopophilia. Now, interestingly, Roger gets to the world's oldest profession um, and street walking and prostitution, but the the word itself doesn't, you know, I, I, in the, the way that we use it these days, doesn't get yeah. to it at all. So you have to you have to find yourself in the the column of impurity to to really know about how the word works. Hmm. Hmm. Pornography or pornographic. Ah, interesting. The first entry is not nice, vulgar, oh. and then erotic. Roger, oh. your politics are very clearly, your sexual politics are very clearly displayed in that yeah. one little placey. And then pornography comes back to impurity as porn did. Hmm. Hmm. It's also, it's Britishness is showing Not with nice. page three being involved there. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. There's another, another brilliant example of how um, nudity and the objectification of women remained absolutely commonplace until really quite recently page three has has not long been gone oh it's gone now it's mm, it, it's changed it hasn't gone oh okay yeah it still objectifies women it just doesn't show their nipples basically oh okay well and the notion that that suddenly makes everything better yes, I, I was I gonna say well well thankfully all that's behind us indeed. then yeah yeah but then uh, well Let's not get into how I feel about the sun. No. We don't have time. We, don't. we literally don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> and as for anatomy. Anatomy. We have structure. Oh, the irony. Yeah. <laughs> Biology and zoology. Hmm. Hmm. That's all Roger has to say. In fact, no, I tell a lie. We have anatomical, structurist. Uh, sorry, structural. We have anatomist, zoologist, anatom anatomization. I'll put my teeth in, which uh, is gloss here is as decomposition. Oh. Anatomize, oh. sunder or class, uh, and then anatomy, structure, biology, zoology. See, that's so no structure. Sense. That idea is what I expected anatomy to mean. Mm, yeah, and it is in fact the deconstruction. And that's it for this episode of Lexitecture. Thanks for listening, and if you enjoyed what you heard, please give us a rating and review on iTunes, and be sure to tell all your word nerd friends about us too. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter by searching Lexitecture, L-E-X-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E. -E -E. And if you'd like to get in touch with us about the things we talked about this episode, you can send us an email at words at lexitecture.com. Special thanks to the Joy Drops for our theme music, and we'll talk to you again next week. Okay, 
So the book that I was reading, I've read it many, many times. I really, really love this book. It's by Christopher Brookmeyer. Uh, do you know Christopher Brookmeyer? Are you aware of him? No. I've I have heard surely him. told you before about Christopher Brookmeyer. He he is sometimes uh, likened to the this, this Scottish Carl Hyacin. Um, that's in fact there's a quote on the back of this particular book that brings up Elmore Leonard and Carl Hyacin. He is amazingly, incredibly Scottish, and his books are very much books written by a Scotsman in Scotland about Scot- Scottish people, and uh, and they're they're generally sort of crime crimeish. You'd find them in the crime section of a bookshop, but okay. they they're just they're they're pretty wonderful. The f- the first Christopher Brookmeyer book that I read. Which I, I always find it interesting now. I remember hearing him say that it was the first of his books that was published, but the third that he had written. Which mm. is uh, a, a good point to remember if you're an aspiring writer, I think. But it's yeah. called Quite Ugly, Quite Ugly One Morning. And it starts off with, or certainly the kind of inciting incident, is the discovery of a body in a flat in Edinburgh. And the body has been really roughed up prior to death okay there's blood everywhere the corpse's two index fingers have been removed and put up the corpse's nose oh and and to to go with all to go along with all of that there is an almighty jobby on the mantelpiece an almighty jobby you don't know what a jobby is. How wonderful. You see, th- this is it. The term is used in Brookmeyer's book as, as exactly that. A jobby is a poo or a shite or, a, you know, how, okay. however you want to describe it. So there's okay. this horrendously, mu- when the police, by the time the police show up, there's this horrendously mutilated corpse, lots of blood. There's a huge puddle of vomit from where the postman who initially discovered the body had lost his lunch. Right. And there is this massive steaming turd on the mantelpiece. And what? okay. And as as an introduction to the world of Brookmeyer, it's a pretty good one. So uh yeah, very very irreverent, but but very good. And so that book introduces Jack Parlabane, who is the protagonist in most of the books that I've read, certainly, and this one is also a a Parlabane book, Country of the Blind. And it's um Parlabane's an investigative journalist. And he's talking about Aunt Sally's. Now, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with that term until I read this book. Okay. And an Aunt Sally is actually defined here a dummy to throw things at so that you can vent spleen and act a hard case without actually taking on a real opponent who can hit back. So politicians love Aunt Sally's. Right. And the two characters here are discussing pornography. And Parlabane says that. Pornography is an Aunt Sally. And the character he's talking to says, it's not exactly an Aunt Sally, though, is it? And Parlamine says, I understand your reservations, Nicole, but believe me, it's the biggest one there is. It's the queen of Aunt Sally's. It's a cheap politician's wet dream. Christ, these days, nobody in government wants to suggest or implement a policy that won't just deliver a return before the next election or even before the next opinion poll. But this, it's video nasties all over again. Not just something you can blame, but something you can ban so that you can show the electorate that you're getting something done. So, talks a bit more about uh, video nasties and and how that kind of played out in in British. The character says, but this isn't Child's Play 3 or Reservoir Dogs, Jack. This is hard porn, Nicole protested. Ooh, it's the bogeyman, isn't it? All dark and scary. But think about it, Nicole. Rape, sexual violence, misogyny, these things have been around since we came down from the trees. Pornography happens along at the arse end of the 20th century and it's suddenly the cause of it all. What, does it work retroactively? Do wank mags travel through time? Perhaps Stephen Hawking could investigate. (laughs) She says, but you've still got to admit, we're talking about some material that is highly offensive to women. No, he insisted. We're talking about material that some women find highly offensive. There's a difference. But bollocks to all this liberal introspective navel-gazing. You want to retire to a quiet room with a VCR and a box of hankies? Fine with me. I'll even recommend an optician. That's not your scene. Cool with me too. The moral debate is not relevant here. What we've got to concentrate on is the politician's contract because it's one of the best there is. And what's that? It's simple. 
When asked whether sexually explicit material should be legal in the UK, most people say yes it should. Ask the same people if hardcore pornography should be legal and they all say no. So you ask them to define pornography and they say sexual material that is perverse, depraved, corrupting, offensive to women, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who the fuck's going to say yes, let's legalise that? Nobody. But it's completely meaningless. There's no imperial scale of depravity, no universal standard of what is offensive to women or to men for that matter. It's entirely subjective. That's why pornography, like it or loathe it, is the greatest Aunt Sally in politics. Which is, in a very long-winded but wonderfully Brookmyrian way, pretty much saying, I know it when I'll see it.